I'm an urban farmer. <laughs> so I grow food in the city of Montreal on roofs of buildings, believe it or not. And it's something that I'm very, very proud of. It's something that puts a smile on my face every morning. And a while back, I was talking to my aunt in Lebanon, and where I'm originally from. I, I grew up in Lebanon in a small village that's actually self-sustaining. Uh, it's a village that grows its own food, which is hard to find these days. So if the butcher didn't cut a cow that day, we ate vegetables. <laughs> so there I was talking to my aunt, and I was so excited, and I was telling her how awesome my work is and how we're building, how we're building greenhouses and feeding people right in the heart of the city. And she looks at me and says, Sweetie, we've been doing this all of our lives. There's nothing new here. And that got me thinking. It's absolutely true. Nothing about urban agriculture is really revolutionary. It's simply a recreation of something that's very, very old. So then why am I here talking to you today about urban agriculture? Why is it an important topic? Well, because we're not eating what my aunt eats. We're not eating what I used to eat when I grew up back in Lebanon. What we eat today, because we live in cities, comes from very far away. Our food has traveled an average of 1,500 miles to make it to our plate. And food travels as good as a two-year-old child on a plane. <laughs> food travels really, really bad. In fact, uh, food is, is packed, repacked, refrigerated, sold and resold many times over. And by the time it makes it to the consumer, it's lost its nutrients, it's lost its taste, texture, and smells. And actually, the really interesting number is, you know, we're talking about, a lot about reducing waste, is that when a farmer in an industrial farm is looking at a plant of tomato, half of these tomatoes will never make it to the consumer because of this. And the cultivars and the varieties that are chosen in terms of industrial farming are cultivars and varieties that are chosen for their toughness and transportability and not their taste. There used to be a time where you could, we could choose from 500 different tomatoes to grow in a greenhouse, and now what we're eating is a collection of only 12. Roughly 12 cultivars of tomatoes that are all tough, that will yield very well, that are rock as, hard as rocks, but don't necessarily have the same taste. And when you look at industrial farming, the, the process of industrial farming is far from optimal. Industrial farms today are massive consumers of land, of water, of energy, of resources. And what's been really striking for me during my research in hydroponics is that they're very elusive. Uh, I spent a good amount of time simply trying to find farms. I actually couldn't find farms, and I ended up concluding that farms are big black boxes. Uh, not only can we not find them, it's actually very hard to even go inside of a farm. The secret process of growing food. It's elusive. Five years ago, I said to myself, what if you could change the way we grow food? What if you can grow food in a more responsible way? And what if you can create a direct link with the consumer and go straight to the consumer, bypass the entire network, forget about the distribution network, forget about the wholesalers, retailers, and truckers, and go straight to the consumer? And it started off as a bit of a dream. It's something that, you know, I have a lot of dreams, and, and very few of them actually uh, and the fine become projects. But this, this dream stuck. And with a group of engineers and architects, um, I like to call them the superheroes, uh, five years ago, we started working. And we started working on a new form of agriculture, what we like to call agriculture 2.0. So we started off by asking ourselves, if we want to grow food, how can we grow it in a more responsible way? So we knew that there were a lot of challenges in the food production process, and we knew that we had to change the way we grew food. So we define responsible agricultures in four different ways. First of all, using no new land. I think that the previous presenter did a great job at, ex at explaining the challenges we have today as we go from 7 billion to 9 billion and with less land. So the good news, it turns out that rooftop spaces are absolutely fantastic for growing food. Someone might look at a roof and, and think of it as the underwear of a building. It's an ignored space, it's a heat island, um, it needs maintenance, we have to go up there every now and then and clean it, but no one likes roofs. They're the underwear. <laughs> but it turns out that underwear is an incredibly fertile space. In this specific building that, that, that you see behind me here, we receive over half a million dollars in free energy every single year, simply from the sun. Not to mention that we receive half of our heating energy from the building below. And what's great about being in the city is the carbon dioxide levels are higher, something else that plants need. So responsible agriculture is starting off by using no land and using water, a scarce resource, in a more responsible way. 
So harvesting rainwater, and more importantly, recirculating nutrient water, nutrient-rich water. And again, I think the previous presenter explained the importance and the link between blue algae and phosphor-rich water leaching into lakes and rivers. So by having a closed-loop system, not only are we growing in a more responsible way, but we're actually saving a lot of money. Responsible agriculture means using no synthetic pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides. And you can actually do this, because we've been doing it for many, many years prior to the Green Revolution. It works really well. And it's simply by using biocontrols, insects. So we have good insects in the greenhouse, like ladybugs, that actually attack bad insects, such as aphids or whiteflies. And every now and then, we see them having sex. <laughs> they, they, they love the conditions in the greenhouse for some reason. <laughs> and finally, responsible agriculture means growing good food, selecting cultivars and varieties for their taste, for their nutrition, for their smell and texture. Heirloom tomatoes, purple basils, white cucumbers, wild Persian cresses, the possibilities are limitless. What we can grow in a greenhouse, what we can feed you guys, is unbelievable. But what we find in the grocery store is only the subset that will transport very, very well. So after defining responsible agriculture, in September 2010, we started working. And what, I'm going to walk you through a few slides that show you the process of construction. What you don't see in here is the four years of technology development that went prior to construction. We had to develop our own proprietary, our own patent pending uh, water circulation systems, polyculture growing systems that allow us to grow multi-crops in the same greenhouse, still achieving the same yields as a monoculture grower. We developed water circulation techniques and, and microclimate management software. So our entire greenhouses are managed by a piece of software. But real quick, I'll walk you through a typical construction. We take an existing roof, we keep the existing membrane, we erect a structure made out of steel, galvanized steel, aluminum, and glass. And it actually, this process goes quite fast. Believe it or not, we got the structure up in less than three weeks. And you can see we used some cranes to bring the uh, material up to the roof. And in this case, it was a two-story building. And this is a picture, it's, it's a bit of an inside, uh, it shows you a bit the inside of the greenhouse, just prior to planting. And you can see actually our energy curtains uh, another feature that helps save energy, we deploy it at, during the nighttime and, and it envelopes the greenhouse, the plants. And the temperature above our energy curtain could be minus 10 degrees Celsius, where it's below the energy curtain is a 22 degree, 23 degree Celsius uh, climate. After the construction process, and on September, and actually on February 28, 2011, we planted the first seeds of the first plants in, our, in the world's first commercial rooftop greenhouse. And it's something that we're very proud of. It's something that really, I remember the team really celebrated that day, and we popped a lot of champagne bottles, and they were not local. <laughs> <laughs> they were the good kind. <laughs> and just two months after that very first day, my niece, Maya, at eight months old, had her first solid food, and it was one of our tomatoes, a cherry tomato grown in Montreal, and she loves our tomatoes. And this is something that brings me most joy, seeing kids going through vegetables like they're candy. And today, almost a year later, we feed 2,000 people with vegetables that are harvested the exact same day that have never seen the inside of a fridge. Vegetables harvested in the heart of the city, on a rooftop, using half the energy to heat the building and a fraction of the water and nutrients. And because of the direct link with our consumers, we distribute our food to drop points. And drop points are universities, coffee shops, all over the island. But the process is so efficient that we only need $15 in fuel per day to feed 2,000 people. And what's been actually a huge surprise to us is seeing how this little farm in Montreal was able to connect the community. Early on, when we started construction, people would stop by and, and would ask us if they could visit. We had requests from universities, from schools, from synagogues, from churches, all wanting to visit a farm. And, and it was really great to see how, to date, we've had over 10,000 visitors to the greenhouse, 10,000 people that now understand where food comes from, 10,000 people that have met a farmer, that really kids that have seen how a tomato plant grows, how a cucumber should taste like. And that's something that's been a, a big surprise to us, but it's been a, a, a very, I've, I'm ecstatic to see that. And another great moment for me is walking into one of our drop points between the hours of 3 and 6 p.m. and seeing 30, 40 customers rushing to grab their, their vegetable baskets, 
by taking the time to exchange recipes, phone numbers, veggies, and to truly connect. So I'm going to leave you with a few images. I think, I think everybody likes images. <laughs> Believe it or not, the first is actually a picture of the land that used to exist where we have built our greenhouse 40 years ago. So 40 years ago, prior to the construction of the industrial building, there used to be a farm, and a farmer used to work here feeding people. For 37 years, that spot was replaced by an industrial building that contributed to heat islands and displaced a farmer. The good news is this spot is once again a fertile plot of land, employing many and feeding many, many more and helping make our world a better place. So imagine cities that feed their own inhabitants. Imagine communities that are connected by farms. Imagine knowing your farmer and knowing your food. When we celebrated our first anniversary at Lufa, <laughs> what we chose to celebrate was, was not the beginning of the construction. It wasn't the end of the construction. It was the day we had the first seeds planted. Because I remember very well that day, our carbon dioxide levels started dropping, and our humidity levels started rising just as the plants made it into the greenhouse. That was the first beat, the first sign of life. Now imagine cities full of life. Merci. <laughs>